Uh, hello, I'm Carol from Brazil. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Katie Ehring, uh, our speaker today, to talk about the geometology in Olympic Dam. Katie completed her Bachelor in Geology in California State University, Fresno, and then later completed her PhD in Geology at University of California, Berkeley, in 1991. She left San Francisco in 1992 to join the former Western Mining Corporation as a research geologist to work on the genesis of the Olympic Dam deposit in Australia and to provide mineralogical support for the Olympic Dam processing plant. In 2006, she moved from Olympic Dam to Adelaide to lead the development of the Olympic Dam Ge Geometallurgy Program. Over the past 28 years, she has remained focused on using mineralogy to solve processing issues, predicting metallurgy performance, uh, unraveling the complex geology history of Olympic Dam deposit, and, to and using deposit scales, mineralogical and geological insights as input to discovery new ISG deposits. She has supervised 14 PhD students and and nine postgraduate researchers working on Olympic Dam based projects. She, she has shared the geological, geometallurgical uh, knowledge gained from Olympic Dam and Trilodian Prospect by authority and co authoring more than 125 published papers and delivered more than 50 presentations. In 2017, she received the Professional Excellence. Excellence Award from the US Mine and a degree of Doctorate of Geology Honors caused from Finders uh, University in recognition of her contribution to the geological and geometallurgical understanding of, of Olympic Dam. In 2018, she was awarded the Geological, uh, geological Society of Australia Bruce Webb Medal and become a chartered professional of house mine. Earlier this year, she has awarded the Society of Economic uh, Geologists Silver Medal. So congratulations for your, your achievements, Katie Ehrens, and we are really excited to hear from you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Felipe. And it's a real honor for me to be here this evening or in the morning, wherever we are in the world. Because uh, this is my second pres uh, the, the second presentation that I've had the privilege to deliver on the Ore Deposits Hub. So we'll launch right into it. Uh, Olympic Dam. It's good. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought here. Okay, the Olympic Dam Geometallurgy and how we're using mineralogy to actually to predict metallurgical performance. Standard disclaimer that we're, we're obliged to share with you. It just says, be cautious of, of any investments that you make. The most important thing is acknowledgements. And even though I'm presenting here this evening on my own, a lot of the work in here or all the work is, is based on the effort of a lot of people. And I'd especially like to acknowledge the geometallurgy team, Vanessa, Michelle, Benjamin, uh, Jan, and Edeltrow, who support me in the background and do the vast majority of the work. And Jesse Clark, who's helped with some of the images in the background, and Jesse co-authored or co-presented um, a few weeks ago or a month ago on the Ore Deposits Hub also. Now, let's think about, about Geomet, but step back a little bit further. And by going into statistics and studies that have been done over the last 20 years, we know typically on average that greater than 50% of new mining projects fail. That's a pretty high failure rate. And fail means that all the way from process design up until a few years into production, that new mining projects have failed to deliver the metal production that they set that they were designed to, to deliver. Now, where do things go wrong? And this slide, this part of the slide here was taken directly from Peter McCarthy, a 2014 presentation that he did. But there are a lot of other people that have done very similar things and over over again, over 20 years. And down at the bottom of the page, there's just a few references for some more modern ones. But where do mining projects fail? 
and over three general categories is from in the mind design and scheduling end, optimistic ramp up schedules, learning curves, not really considered and, and production schedules, probably a bit optimistic. They've also failed because of, uh, of, of geology resource and reserve estimations not being right, inattention to local variability, uh, statistics and modeling often overrode common sense, metallurgical test work and sampling and scale up weren't quite up to modern standards, metallurgical domains within the ore body were not understood, even though geological domains would have been, uh, testing is not done on representative composites and, and, and the failure really to identify any of the process contaminants. And you say, well, as geoscientists, what are we really responsible for? Or what do we have input into? We have small amounts of input into mine design and scheduling, but our area is around the ore body, you know, and making sure that we actually characterize that ore body properly. And then, and then also be involved in the metallurgical testing or drive the geometallurgical testing that goes on. So what's the impact of this very high failure rate across, the, across mining projects? And it's, and it's a global problem. And it really gets down to you know, delayed investment, sorry, delayed return on investments. And we have to about think about mines from the time that projects start until they go into production there are hundreds of millions of dollars of investment up to billions of dollars. So it's a, it's a massive amount of lost opportunity that we have. But you say, ah, maybe I'm not necessarily involved in a startup or anything, I'm working in an operation. Well, when we don't get the GMET right and we don't get a lot of other things right, we continue to have problems in operating plants. And do we have them? Yes, 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 yes. And we all think about the classic sort of thing when you work in a, in a, in a, in a, at a mine where there's a processing plant, is metallurgy is always blaming geology, geology is always blaming metallurgy in the mine, and it just goes on and on. So today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about, about uh, geometallurgy, the Olympic Dam operations, a little bit about the geology and mineralogy at Olympic Dam, recovering metals from the Olympic Dam ore, and the Olympic Dam Geomet program, along with some conclusions. And the easiest way to focus an organization on metallurgical or geometallurgical issues is to have your processing plant come to a screeching halt. And this picture here just shows, and we can see a, a hose downhill for scale. This material has, has about 55 to 60% solids in it. So that means, um, it, 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 shouldn't be, it shouldn't be looking like that. And you can see it's not flowing anywhere. The thing about this, this is also 70 degrees centigrade when it comes out of that hatch there. And it, it has a pH of about 0.5. And fortunately, nobody was in the way of that when, when that gave through there. And we call that a gel. And, and this material should, in the tank, it looks like a chocolate milk. But here, it clearly doesn't look like chocolate milk. So the first question that pops up, is it ore related or is it processed? or is it both? So we do geometallurgy at Olympic Dam really to avoid process surprises. So our motto is really no processing surprises related to unknown or characteristics. There's a lot of definitions out and about about what geometallurgy actually is. And I picked on Steve Williams one, I think it's pretty good. And he says that geometallurgy is the study of the drivers of metallurgical response that lie in the geology and mineralogy of the deposit. And Steve is actually um, a metallurgist or process engineer. There's a couple things that we use in the background and I'll call these axioms or these things that are almost self-evident that elements occur in mineral deposits as minerals or elements are used as proxies for minerals. We've got to think about that. Minerals are mined and metallurgy extracts elements from the minerals. The second kind of self-truth or the axiom, and this is an excellent quote, is rock type controls throughput and mineralogy controls metallurgy. So a lot of the stuff that we do on Geomet is really about taking a lot of quantitative, or sorry, qualitative observations that we have in geoscience and trying to quantify those so that we can actually make business decisions on those. So the hypothesis that we started with is that on, this, on the sample scale, if we can express the mineralogy, 
the weight percent of the mineralogy in the sample as a function of the composition. And we can express the metallurgical performance, which means uh, throughput, recoveries, reagent consumptions, anything to do with the process as a function of the mineralogy or texture and process conditions, then we can actually predict metallurgical performance across the entire deposit. Easier said than done. So Olympic Dam, first of all, Olympic Dam, for those that don't know, this is South Australia and Adelaide sits about here. Olympic Dam is up here, 550, mile, 550 kilometers north, northwest of Adelaide. This is an overview of the surface operations at Olympic Dam as the process plant. But the thing you notice in the background is it's flat. The only topography out in this part of Australia are sand dunes and sand dunes, you know, up to 10 meters high, but this is just sand, so absolutely flat. And what you don't see is the big mine in the background. The deposit was discovered by WMC in July, 1975, and it turned out to be a new deposit type. Underground access commenced in 1982, production commenced in 1988, and BHP acquired WMC in July 2005. That's when we started embarking on a, a very big geometallurgy program. The current operation Olympic Dam consists of mechanized sublevel open scope mining, and it's all underground, so the only manifestations of that underground mine that we have on the surface is a few shafts but mainly all the ventilation shafts that run up and down this direction. There's a sulfide uh, grinding circuit and a sulfide concentrator. There's a hydrometallurgical circuit here that extracts the uranium out. There's a single stage flash smelter. Uh, we also have a, an attached acid plant onto that. And we have uh, electro one and electro refined refineries and precious gold, precious gold and sorry, precious metals uh, refineries on site. Everything is done on site. We have, to, we have to have a smelter and refineries on site because we actually produce, one of our products is uranium. And because of uranium, that means we have to, all of our other product, our copper products and gold and silver bullion actually have to be purified to a very, or have to be refined to a very high level of purity before we can ship them off site. And that's actually achieved. The benefit of, of having this on site for a geologist or a metallurgist is that there's a lot to learn. So I can be exposed to smelting and, and leaching and everything else I can possibly think of in the process right at Olympic Dam. The geology of Olympic Dam, and first of all, we'll reference you to the ore deposits hub recording that we did a month ago. For, talk to you about deep that talks about detailed geology and, um, and structure about the deposit. This is a geological plan, part of the deposit, and it's cut at about 350 meters, meters beneath the surface. Fresh Roxby Downs granite sits out in this pink area. Dashed line in here just represents inside of that what we call the Olympic Dam Breccia complex. Then this orange line here, this orange dashed line represents our resource outline and the and the variety of colors here are a whole variety of different minor lithologies that we'll talk about they just briefly touch on sorry the key points for the for this image is that there's that the deposit is a breccia hosted iron oxide copper uranium gold silver deposit it is under 350 meters of cover and the cover is unaltered undeformed unmineralized and i often say uninteresting the, the footprint, the alteration footprint, or really the outlines of the breccia complex itself is about 50 square kilometers at about 350 meters beneath the surface. The Roxby Downs granite is 1,593 million years old. And the deposit footprint, really everything that lies within this orange outline is six kilometers in, in the diagonal sense, about three kilometers wide. Typically the ore zones ended, ended about 800 meters depth but in this part of the deposit, we do have of mineralization that extends down to 2.3 kilometers depth. There is a deposit-wide mineralogical zonation patterns. Olympic Dam is no different than any other major deposit or even small ones, that you do have alteration in mineralogical zonation. These, this pink to gray, different shades of gray transition actually represent the transition from a rock that's got about 3% iron 
up to the cent more central parts of the deposit that have up to 60% iron in it. The most characteristic feature in this deposit really is the iron oxides. And we transition from, an, uh, from a reduced iron facies into more oxidized iron facies as we go from the depth and the edges in the deposit more towards the center and the shallower parts. And that's manifested by the presence of magnetite apatite chlorite that gets overprinted by hematite and sericite. There's also other alteration patterns that exist there. Again, the iron reduced face, siderite. We have a siderite fluorite barite, uh, famous for the, the sulfide zonation pattern where we transition from pyrite to calcopyrite to boronite to calcocyte. There's also a polymetallic lead zinc uh, silver overprint on it and a granite related moly tin tungsten signature. The uranium minerals are uraninite, coffinite, and branerite, and there's three styles of gold mineralization. But what we wanna do is, is think about this breccia complex and the, 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 the lithological types in the deposit, fortunately are very limited. The Roxby Downs granite, which is over this, all the stuff in pink. And the vast majority of this deposit really is the brecciation and alteration of that granite transforming from something that looks like this upper left-hand corner to the, this, what we call the hem is a rock down here in the lower right. But there are other minor lithologies and they look like they're more abundant in the shallower parts, but they do decrease with depth. We have felsic and, ma felsic and mafic, ultramafic rocks within the deposit. We also have what we call our bedded clastic facies, which are actually a lot of, um, are, have formed by the, by the weathering or I'd say, by the erosion of some of these other facies in here. Now, when we got to think about in, in, in the geomet world, what we want to do is quantify our observations and quantify our observations so we can put them into predictive models. And, and what I'm showing here is we're going to transition from the fresh Roxby Downs granite all the way through what we call the HEMQ, the center part of the deposit. And, and we, we see this transition. And, and this transition is actually just reflected in increasing iron content. But there's also other things happening in, in, in during this transition. If we plot the simple weight percent of iron in the rock versus the sodium potassium ratio, we start off on fresh rocks be downs granite. And we're just really going to look out on more on the edges of the deposit. So we go out and real fresh rocks be downs granite and we can start seeing progressive transition. We turn over as we hit the edges of the deposit and we just start adding iron in. And this is just a, an example of, of what the HEMQ or that center, more center part of the deposit looks like. And why I like these images or any images when we're doing predictive modeling, we like lines and we like curves. And as soon as we can start, as soon as we see that, we can start doing something with that. Another simpler way of looking at some of the alteration that we see in the deposit is simple, simple things of, of potassium versus sodium. And out here again, fresh Roxby Downs granite when we're way away from the deposit. And as we start moving towards the edges of the breccia complex itself, we start altering the plagioclase to sericite. We really wipe out all the plage. The vector starts changing directions. So we've, we've stripped the deposit of a fair amount of its sodium before we've even hit the ore zones. And then we start replacing the sericite, sorry, replacing the K-Feldspar with sericite. We continue to pump iron into the system, but we're now progressively stripping out the sodium, sorry, the potassium. Hematite replaces sericite, and then eventually the only thing that's really left is hematite, quartz, and barite in the center. So early on when we we're doing all of our stuff as a good geologist, what we try to do is say, uh, well, we can just work on the breccia textures to tell us a lot about the deposit. But after quite a long time of working on the breccia textures and trying to relate those to metallurgical response, we know that the breccia textures are actually just obscuring the whole view and, the, and it's just too complex. So we fall back on some of those chemical relationships that with geochemical relationships we saw on the other page on the previous slide. And we go back and we say this whole deposit can be typified by looking at the change in the iron concentration starting out in fresh granite going all the way to the center. With that, we also have uh, silica and plus 30 other odd elements and even up to the almost the whole periodic table. And, and what we see is there's a whole suite of elements that as the iron content increases, so does, the, so does some other elements, mainly the hydrothermal elements. 
But as the iron content increases, we also have the granite really is, is being stripped away. So really all the primary elements in that granite gradually get depleted. But what's also shown in here is simple things like the iron versus the, the bulk dry density of which we do measurements on that. And that's what that actually shows. So it says that iron increases, the bulk dry density increases, and this also helps, helps to explain some of our geophysical anomalies. When we, when we really start focusing on the geochem and start breaking with our traditional geological ties and say, I must worry about the texture of the rock, what we find, what we really start thinking about is, is what looks incredibly complex, the breccia textures. That complex breccia textures actually just disguises the simplistic geochem that we have. And then once we have simplistic geochem, we can actually start thinking about being able to predict the minerals. So Olympic Dam. Olympic Dam has greater than 135 minerals in it. And as we continue to do more and more work, and when I say we, I also mean a lot of our uh, academic research partners also continue to do work. We discover more and more. And we'd say in the, in the geomet set, which ones do we need to characterize? And it's really any that impact on your process. And that means process all the way from mining through to the final products. Fortunately, that 135 minerals can be dropped down to 15 that are, that are really, really important ones. And those 15 minerals actually account for about 99.5% 99 of the ores. And so that's good. So it's the, it's the sulfides, pyrite, calcopyrite, boronite, calcocyte, a lot lesser extents of molybdenite, sphalerite, and galena, and our major gang minerals, hematite, quartz, muscovite, or sericite, orthoclase, chlorite, barite, siderite, and fluorite. With that, we can describe probably 95%, 99% of our full metallurgical process. Now, again, thinking about geomet, we need to quantify. And so we're gonna, we'll start with the sulfides and that was, the, that was our first real big win. By the geological observations that, we, that we've had from the beginning of, uh, since the first hole was drilled at Olympic Dam, recognize that you transition from pyrite, you know, pyrite, calcopyrite, calcopyrite, boronite, calcocyte up through that sequence. And that there's really no, we don't see calcocyte ever touching calcopyrite or pyrite. We don't see boronite touching pyrite. That shows us that there's a real simple um, hypogene sulfide transition going on. And that actually gives us a lot of predictive power. So as geologists, we recognize all these things. We can map, we can map out all these, these textures or we can qualitatively map them out, but we can actually quantify them. So over here, as geologists, what we would first fall on, I want to understand, I want to think and understand about what the sulfides are telling me. We fall back on what we're traditionally taught, you know, and that's looking at ternary diagrams. Absolutely fantastic. And we look at it and we can see, oh, we're kind of on nice little tie lines here, which tells us a lot. But then we change it back into a world where, where metallurgists speak a little bit, and they speak of the rock in terms of the copper to sulfur ratio, which is really a proxy for these sulfides and what the grades are and, and what we can do if we thought of we have a rock that has 100% sulfides in it. I can plot mixtures of all four of these sulfides together, one, two, three, or all four of them, and they're gonna plot along this curve here. And when we did that, that, that become incredibly powerful because I can take this kind of information, replot it in a different way, and I can predict absolutely precisely the, um, abs the, the weight percents of pyrite, calcopyrite, boronite, calcocyte on every single sample that we assay and any sing every single drill core sample that we assay. That allows me to actually tell me what the con grade is and all kinds of other parameters based on, 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 on the simple assays that we do in the drill core. But backed up by this qualitative relationship that geologists have recognized from the beginning at Olympic Dam. So we say the sulfide's easy to do. Next win, we had we are, our, our sales or our chests were all puffed up because we achieved a lot. Next one, well, let's go after the gang minerals. We've done a lot of, a lot of measured mineralogy and we'll see even more. But we can actually predict the gang mineralogy, the, major, the, the dominant gang mineralogy, but that prediction is based on doing a lot of quantitative XRD and then a lot later supported by tens of thousands of MLA measurements also. 
So by doing quantitative modal mineralogy and then bending that information based on what we thought about the, just the iron content, we can look at the percent, the percent of hematite. We go up the list, hematite, quartz, sericite, K feldspar, little blue lines is, 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 um, is chlorite, and then the orange, the green is, is fluorite. And as we increase in the iron content going across the, the horizontal axis, obviously the hematite content goes up, the quartz is decreasing, um, the, the, the sericite is decreasing, and, and the other minerals are doing it too, not the sulfide so much. But, that, but again, when we see things like this, that means I can actually, they behave in lines, and as soon as they start behaving on lines or curves, we can do some predict, predictions with this. So not only can we quantify the sulfides, we can also quantify the gang minerals, really based on drill core assays. Now, we're all out there, and it's all about mineralogy. And the mineralogy that we have, there's a plethora really of mineralogical measurement techniques out there and methods. The, the one that you choose depends on your deposit and, the, and your business requirements. So whatever we do at Olympic Dam is nowhere is it, is it applicable to everybody else. But some of the, these other things that are out there, you know, uh, old traditional kind of CIP norm calculations that we learned about, back when we were doing igneous petrography. petrography. Um, there's automated techniques like MLA and QuimScan and Incas and, and, and their modern equivalent in TEMA. There's, there's quantitative XRD. There's um, high logger or all the hyperspectral techniques. And then you got quantifications down to the nanoscale. And what we have to think about, we actually want to start predicting minerals at the deposit scale. So at OD, we actually use the element to mineral conversion methods and we call OD norm, which is actually a modified CIP norm for Olympic Dam. But that norm has been, normative calculation has been validated by extensive measured mineralogy that we even continue to do today. So now let's step, step back and look at the deposit again. Uh, sorry, back. Now, we, we're going to assume that we have the ability to, to measure a lot of the minerals, but Again, what do we really need to focus on? And what we need to focus on really depends on our process plan. So here is a grossly simplified flow chart for Olympic Dam, underground mining, dirt gets put onto the stockpile. It gets, it gets ground down to 75 microns and then we go through a sulfide flotation, no different than a whole lot of other people. This is, this making a concentrate is the, is where most places stop. Most sulfide concentrates, you make a concentrate and you ship it someplace, you ship it someplace else to be to be smelted and refined. At Olympic Dam, that's kind of almost the beginning. We take our con copper stream, uh, concentrate, we leach it to remove a little bit of uranium and fluorine. It goes into the smelter. The smelter, we make an anode and that goes into an ER refinery. And we make nine, five, nine, five nines pure copper cathode. From there, the slimes that end up, all the impurities that are in that anode actually end up at the bottom of the, of the refinery. And that's, but that's where the gold and silver are and other things like arsenic, selenium, bismuth, tellurium, antimony, radionuclides, a whole variety of things. One side, make gold and silver bullion out of that. Our flotation tailings, that's where the bulk of our uranium goes, about 85% of it. It goes into a, a, an acid leach circuit. We separate. Uh, the uranium, once we dissolve all, put the uranium in the solution, we have to separate all the uranium from the uranium bearing solutions and a little bit of copper. From the solids, it goes into an SX circuit. The uranium goes one way, we roast it, make uranium oxide. The copper in solution, the little bit that's there, actually goes into electro winning circuit and we make EW cathode. So what we have to do when we get asked about, uh, about ore types, or types are dependent on what part of the process we are talking about. If I was only worried about a grinding circuit and a float sulfide concentrator, our ore types would be very, would be far more manageable. But as soon as I start talking about an ore type for the sulfide concentrator, what's the ore type for here? What's the ore type for here? Or the properties in the ore that might impact on here? Or the tailings leach circuit or the SXEW? It becomes a real nightmare. So we got away from using thinking about ore types and started talking really about mineral mixes. And that's really what it's about. It's the different mineral mixes that occur in different parts of the plant and actually how those minerals 
in those different mixtures actually respond to different parts of the plant. So as we go along and we say, okay, and we have an incredibly uh, complicated circuit at Olympic Dam, that what are, we, what are we actually supposed to quantify as far as, um, as far as properties for geomet? What we do is we look at the process drivers that are affected by ore characteristics, not the process conditions. Process conditions, the, the temperature at which the plant operates at, or the mill, how quick the mill actually grinds, or leaching temperatures, or any of those things are actually controlled by the metallurgists. What we need to worry about is, as people looking after geomet, is what are the ore characteristics in the ground that are actually going to impact on that process. So we go through and we say, look at mill throughput. And the things that impact on mill throughput very simplistically is the ore hardness. And for us, that means the relative proportion really of hematite to quartz and sericite. And mill, mill throughput is also about how fine you have to grind or how coarse you have to grind your material to liberate your sulfide. So the sulfide, the properties of the sulfides actually matter. Then you go to flotation performance and flotation is all about making a, a copper concentrate, a sulfide concentrate. So, we, so that means all of understanding what the sulfide recovery is gonna be, what the sulfide minerals are and what little bit of gang minerals that end up in your concentrate and all the deleterious elements, elements that are either gonna be uh, harmful or, or potentially extra beneficial in the smelter, but also what are the ones that are gonna impact on your cathode final products. In Tells Leach, we actually have to worry about acid consumption that's con controlled by sericite and chlorate and a thing called gelling, which is controlled by the amount of chloride in the ore. Uranium extraction is dependent on the uranium mineralogy, but the grain size of those minerals and what uran and which gang minerals the uranium minerals are associated with. Separating the liquids from the solids there are all about these, these chloride and sericite. And we also extract a little bit of copper out of that circuit. So the sulfide mineralogy also impacts on that, on the tails leach. In the smelter, we have to worry about throughput in the smelter. And this, the purpose of smelting is to separate the metal, which is copper from iron, which goes into slag and the sulfur, which is part of our off gas stream. And that off gas stream, we captured that and make sulfuric acid of which we use for, uh, for our leaching circuit. So things that impact on, on on the smelting and refinery side of our process is the sulfide mineralogy, the concentrate grade, which is a function of that sulfide mineralogy, the little bit of gang minerals that are in there, and then things like arsenic, bismuth, selenium, uh, tellurium, and antimony, which are part of, part of uh, the cathode quality suite of elements. For geomet, we also not only worry about those, but, but we worry, we, we, we monitor most of the periodic table because we're also looking for potential additional revenue streams, anything that's deleterious to the, our entire circuit, and anything that might have HSEC implications, and also things that might impact on our final uh, tailing, st tailing storage system. So our, our sampling strategy at Olympic Dam for GMET testing is, is a real tiered process. And if we think back our resource database or our drill hole database is the most extensive database you'll actually ever have in an operation. So we've made a big effort to actually enhance that. In our, at Olympic Dam, we actually have over 3 million meters of diamond drill core, of which we have 2 million assayed samples and they're assayed for 26 elements. There's also density magsess and there's geological logging and geotech logging that goes along with that. For each of those samples that we assay, we calculate very accurately the abundances of 15 minerals using our process, our process called the um, our OD norm. But these 2 million assays actually support our entire resource model. And our resource model actually has 20 million blocks in it. And those blocks are what we end up defining all of our geomet parameters onto. So from the or so the next stage of information that we have, so we think we have 2 million resource samples and forming 20 million resource blocks. Our ore characterization samples, which we have about 12,000 of them, that's where we've done a lot of detailed mineralogy. And these ones allow us to continually confirm and update our, our estimates of calculating mineralogy from the sample composition. And that allows us to continue to validate that process. Those things though, that's a back validation back onto the resource model. The next stage of information, and as we go down this chain here or up that tier of that pyramid, 
the cost per sample starts, it, it's, it goes up a lot. By the time we start doing our geomet testing on samples, we do geomet testing, full geomet testing on about 2,000 samples. And we do testing for comminution properties, rougher, cleaner flotation, leaching test, a few other things. We also do all the same mineralogical characterization that we do back on these 12,000 samples here. We do mineralogy and assaying on a size-by-size -size basis for all of our MET products. That allows us again to confirm that the, the what the that we can calculate the mineral weight percents based on the sample composition, the elements. But we also develop our metallurgical performance predictors as a function of the mineralogy. And fortunately, we don't have to use ore texture and we don't worry about process conditions, but we can actually describe all of our metallurgical performances described as a combination of the minerals and or the assays. It depends on which is the simplest to do. So these things then feed back into the ore characterization, then goes back to that, again, back to feeding that resource model and enhancing that resource model. So we haven't really talked a whole lot about what we actually do with all this information. In order for us to fully describe or, or describe our process plant at a very high level, we have about 50 other geomet attributes that actually have to go into that resource model. And these 50 geomet attributes, or that means our, all of our different metallurgical performance predictors, they're actually expressed as function of variables that we actually have in the resource model, which is the minerals and the assays and density magsus. Minerals, elements, density, magsus are ge geostatistically estimated into each of those 20 million resource blocks that we have. The geomet attributes get calculated on each block post resource estimation process. And that uh, avoids some of the additivity problems that, that are known to uh, that are known to be have problems with uh, metal or physical property measurements. We then can assign a, a real value to each of those 20 million blocks in the in the resource model. And that's used for mine planning. And mine planning from the entire life of mine back to the five-year plan, back to our two-year production plans. And, and we think about our, our attributes that we put into the geomet modeling. It's not a, a, a it's not all the attributes that to describe every single minute step in that process. It's that high level one and that high level comp high level process where we can reduce it down to relatively simple things and we can track along here and describe each of those blocks along the way and say what our recoveries are going to be each step along the way, recoveries and the cost to do that. Now, we've just said we have all these elements, we have all these geomet attributes. Let's look at them just by looking at, at block model slices. So the simple thing across the deposit. So I took the geological map and now we've rotated into a mine planning grid and we've rotated really uh, 57, 57 and a half degrees. And what we're doing is looking at this outline, the resource outline, and at just 350 meters below the below sea level, and looking at the at the copper concentration. Beautiful. You can see structure in this, and it changes as we go down with depth. But what's more important is we just don't show where the calcopyrite and boronite actually are. We actually can plot the the absolute weight percents of things like calcopyrite and boronite, and we can see that. Nice. We can do that for any any of the other sulfites too. But then we go down and say, well, let's look a little bit more power of the information that we have. And the power of the information that we have is hematite. I can quantitatively um, look at the distribution of the weight percent of hematite across the deposit. Same thing for K Feldspar. And as geologists, we're looking at, at these things getting horribly excited, which they are incredibly excited. We could produce alteration indices, which actually help us understand where we go from reduced iron facies into uh, oxidized iron facies, yet there's even more. We go down through and we can look at our, our sub-economic and deleterious elements and, and simple things like moly, arsenic, and zinc, which is some of them a little, just some of the whole list of things. We can look at the distribution of moly throughout the deposit. We say, well, oh, there's a little bit of moly here, which is interesting. Uh, we don't see a lot of moly way up, nor up in, in that northern part. Arsenic has a similar distribution to moly, the moly tin tungsten arsenic association. Zinc is something different, which we would expect it to be. Zinc at high levels actually 
uh, impacts on copper smelting. But these are all the, the parameters you need to worry about. We even go down one more set and look at just two of our uh, predictors of metallurgical performance. And these, these are examples of acid consumption, which has a, uh, which is, which is a, a, a big concern in tails leach and simple things like mill throughput. Acid consumption can be, is expressed simply as a function of the weight percent of, i sorry, this should be um, um, siderite, not sericite, the weight percent of siderite times a function of the weight percent of chloride in the, in the ore. So that just means a weight, per, uh, a function of the weight percents of, of uh, the acid soluble minerals, pretty obvious. And we see that, that acid consumption is high in parts of the deposit. These are not necessarily, these edges are not necessarily high copper bearing areas, but we can look at those. This is an example here of where using a proxy works out pretty well. And for mill throughput, at a local sense or on a short-term scale, we use the simple things like an iron silica ratio. An iron silica ratio is really a reflection of the weight percent of hematite to the weight percent of sericite plus of, of the silica content of sericite and, and quartz. And it's really a calibrated proxy. And we know what we get into troubles is when the iron silica ratios are low. And that also means that our mill throughput is going to be low. So it's actually used, it's, it's something that's assayed in the process plant all the time. And so they can keep track of what's going on. But, but believe me, we also do the proper testing from that. And there's the classic grinding indices that we worry about is uh, bond work index and drop work index, which are important for metallurgists and, and designing of process plants. But actually these indices can also be described as functions of, of simple things like the density and the silica content in the ore body. Then we go further, the amount of power that we're gonna consume in that mill is a function of, of these grinding indices and the size of the, of the, the feed size of the material going into the, into the mill and the size of the material that we grind it down to. So we look at the variability. We're gonna look at the variability across the deposit and even at the stoke scale. This shows again, the outline of the, the, the resource outline and all these, color, all these colors represent stokes in our five-year plan. This is what we call our northern mining area. And when we started off from production in 1988, we started here and we've really been up in this whole body for the last, since uh, 1988. And in about 2015, we started transitioning south and that's called the southern mining area. Again, 15 kilometers. And, and these color areas, just happen to be a, a geographic choice. They're not necessarily uh, related to ore properties. But with all the geomet information, what we can do is we just look at a simple thing like arsenic and the information that we can display and we're gonna kind of look going from north, kind of look eking our way down south. And we can see that, that each of these different stoping areas actually have very different properties for arsenic, but they also have very different uh, characteristics for for all those elements and minerals we look at and their metallurgical properties. So the trick for the mining engineer, the mine planner, is to balance the extraction all of those off so we can get a feed that's appropriate for our process plant. So when we look at, at, at the whole metallurgy side of the world and we communicate in an operation sense or even when you're doing process plant design and even from expiration sense, that geologists and, and mining engineers view the world very, very differently than what our metallurgical friends do. And, and geologists and mining engineers, we're, we're very spatially oriented. But our metallurgists actually, most of them aren't spatially oriented. And this is no, no dig on them or anything like that. But they, you show them a picture of the ore body, they'll say, yeah, that's nice, pretty colors. But their world is actually that conveyor that comes to them. And, and their world is, they, they'll see it they'll see a 3D representation of the body. Geologists, engineers are excited about it, but to the metallurgists, it's so what? So what we need to do is trans transform uh, the information that we see in 3D into something that's a 1D time-based image, a time-based uh, representation of that ore body that we can actually design metal that we can design a process plant for, and then also run that plant process plant. And, and that's all called, that's the mine plan. And the mine plan transforms that 3D representation of the ore deposit into a 1D version, which is used for process design, metal extraction, and prediction of, of, of business profitability. 
Now I should say that, that the idea from the slide and part of it I pinched from John Van. Uh, John Van's one of John Van's famous presentations. And so, but it's really good to say, we need to understand when we're communicating with mining engineers or even metallurgists that we view um, the ores differently. So as a quick summary for Olympic Dam, we have, we have been able to prove or, or sorry, show that our hypothesis that mineral that the minerals in the deposit can be expressed as, as functions of the sample composition by doing metallurgical testing on, on a whole variety of samples across the deposit. We can express metallurgical performance actually as a function of the mineralogy and actually the sample composition. This was transformational for us. Once we were, it was transformational once we were able to fully implement it, but it took us a decade. Um, this information is used for both to for both tactical and strategic value. We're quant we can quantify our geological observations on a sample scale, and that means at a sample scale at about two million. Again, these two million samples that we've assayed in drill core, we can populate the mineralogy into that resource block model, which is this twenty million blocks that represent that that ore body. We conduct metallurgical test work on variability samples, which means a whole mix of the different mineral types that we have and, um, and scattered across that whole deposit, whether vertically or horizontally. And, and that metallurgical testing is supported by detailed assays in mineralogy. That helps us to develop predictors of metallurgical performance. We include mineralogy and metallurgical performance in the mine plan, which means it ends up in the production schedules. And the, it only has value to the business when we can uh, realize our observations or transform our observations and data into something that goes into a mine plan. That's when we actually truly make a, a difference to the organization. Now, for a quick moment, we'll have a, have a quiz. And we'll say, what's the quiz? How many minerals are there? And so for you mineralogy people out there, you'll have a, have a quick think. Just excuse me, I take a drink. You'll think, ah, you'll know this because you looked it up. 5,562 minerals officially accepted by the International Mineralogical Association. How many of these minerals do you need to know? And, and what we had hoped to impress on you that there's no definitive answer. It really depends on your deposit and whatever your metal extraction process happens to be. Then we go through and think that nature is actually kind most of the time. Each mineral deposit type is, is typified by a characteristic suite of minerals, even though every single deposit has its own little quirks to it. There can be more than 100 minerals in your deposit, but as a minimum, you really need to learn about the minerals that actually impact on your process. So we go through and think about the general conclusions that we want to make about geometallurgy and geometallurgy at Olympic Dam. It's really about minerals, 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 and it applies from discovery and some of your first few drill holes that go down when you're uh, doing exploration or conducting exploration all the way through to final products and actually mine closure. We must estimate or measure the mineralogy at the deposit scale at whatever method is appropriate for your deposit. Geologists need to understand how the deposit mineralogy impacts on their final product and all their waste streams. You need to uh, get that mineralogical and metallurgical data into the resource model, which means which that resource model is an input into mine planning. And we really need to learn how to effectively uh, communicate more effectively with non-geoscience disciplines. The first time most you start talking about propolytic alteration, argillic alteration to metallurgists, the first thing you typically see, except for some of the astute ones, you see their eyes start rolling because Geoscience language is, is highly specialized, and we actually have to be aware of our highly specialized language that we use. We have to change that language and communicate to our other colleagues outside of geoscience in a language that's meaningful to them, not only to us. And we need to remember that from, from exploration and even through the mine design, that metal actually has no value until it's a sellable product. So we can have the what we think is the best deposit in the world, but if we can't make something marketable out of, out of it, you might as well walk away. 
One of my more favorite images from Olympic Dam is this is our drill core storage area, uh, part of our drill core storage area now, of which where we have 3 million meters of core stored. Uh, geologist dream. So final little comments I'd like to make is you really need to be proactive and, and befriend your metallurgist or, or process engineer or chemical engineer, whatever they happen to call themselves. They're actually, they're actually a significant friend to geology more than what you realize. And, and we think about it that it's very difficult to justify collecting extensive quantitative mineralogy for the purposes of understanding alteration styles and orogenesis in the deposit. You know, you can be pretty blunt and say, the organization really doesn't care, you know? But what they care about, you can think about and rephrase what, what, what you want and saying, I can actually, by quantifying the mineralogy in the deposit, it mitigates the risk to that processing plant and to my whole asset. And that's a hell of a lot easier to justify. And it's very easy to cost justify. So there's a mutual benefit, you know, there's no processing surprises for the metallurgist, but as geologists, we learn a lot more about the deposit. And I can say as a geologist that's worked at Olympic Dam for the last plus 28 years, I've probably learned more about the geology and the understanding of the mineralogy by having to deal or having to communicate with metallurgy on a regular basis. If I only lived in my geological world, I probably would not have the same insights into that deposit as what we do today. Thank you very much for this really nice uh, presentation. Actually, I learned a lot about this geometrology, and it's really interesting um, this relationship and this idea that you gave us uh, from the geology perspective and the metallurgy. Okay. Thank you. Carol, we have questions in the chat. So we have one we have one question here in the chat, yes. So the person said thank you very much for this great overview on the topic. Just out the curiosity, have you ever measured the scandium content of the ores, leachates or tailings? Uh, yes, and, and scandium, yes, we have assayed for it. And it turns out that, that there is very small amounts of scandium and where there's typically elevated scandium is when you're in the, the rocks that, or sorry, slightly geochemical anomalous scandium is in, in the mafic ultramafic rocks. We don't have, in general, we don't have elevated scandium across the deposit. It's more associated with the mafic ultramafic rocks. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Han. Do you want to un unmute yourself and ask the question, please? Uh, hello, can you hear me properly? Yes. Thank you for the lovely presentation, Kathy. I followed on from the previous Olympic Dam one you gave and I asked you another processing question. Uh, I guess my question is uh, or probably around, what did you find were the main hurdles in convincing, I guess, management or the decision makers in following through with the, I guess, extensive geometallurgical mapping and test work. Um, yep. We often find a lot that the cost seems to be a prohibiting factor when even evaluating projects from a PFS to DFS level. And as you yeah. pointed out in one of your early slides, that's usually where you find you have those oh, oh damn moments when things yes. don't quite respond how they want. Yep. Yeah, so it, it, it's a, it's, there's, there's two different sides of it. Um, when, when BHP purchased WMC, they were very, had experienced, uh, they were already doing Geomet at Escondida and, and had experienced some, some surprises. So when, when they purchased WMC and came to Olympic Dam, they, and, and because we were uh, on a massive project to consider expansion of the deposit, it didn't take any convincing of them to do Geomet. Believe me, they were they were hot onto it and let's do it. But after we finished that big program, the initial work on it, when you go back more into operational mode, is how do you actually con convince your organization that you need it? One of the things that has, has helped tremendously is as our businesses move forward, we have to predict metal out the gate at a lot higher precision than we've ever had to predict before. 
And you cannot do that by assaying your deposit alone. You actually have to do a lot of this work. So it starts, it allows us to tighten up our, our variability, starting to tighten up the, our, our predictors, our predictors of metal out the gate by having this information of which you can't do alone. Process plant hiccups are also a very good way to focus attention. So when we had a lot of the gelling going on, gelling in our circuit was happening in the, at the tail end of WMC and when BHP came in and that brings your place to a screeching halt. And when that happens, you actually have to go through and understand why it went wrong. And, and then when we can go back to the ore in our case, it turns out that our gelling problem was caused by chloride and chloride not at 10%, which is it actually is an issue. Chloride more than about two or three weight percent in the ore body causes problems. That actually took us a long time. So we understood what the problem, where it was, but we couldn't actually predict it accurately enough. And, and that helps uh, support programs going forward. Uh, and we just continue to do that, that sort of work. And as the business requires tighter and tighter predictions, you're forced in the world to start having metallurgy, geomet. But what you have to remember, it doesn't actually have to be an expensive episode. Um, it stops, starts by thinking about minerals at the very early stages of everything you do and quantifying those minerals and coming out with the best way you can quantify those minerals. So even if you didn't do extensive metallurgical testing, you could be making significant advances just by quantifying the minerals in that rock because you can take do shorter versions of metallurgical testing and make some assumptions based on those minerals but it's a start somewhere. And it, it doesn't have to be a big decade long program. It's the discipline to start doing mineralogy early on in your process and, and quantifying the minerals that actually matter to, matter, to, matter to your process. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, Carol? Uh, I have one question here. Uh, Aishi is asking the, uh, the, what the graphite impact, how the graphite impacts the treatment of the ore, the processing plant, please. Yeah, we don't actually have any graphite in the deposit. The only carbon, the carbon that we have is, is, um, is as, as iron carbonates and some calcium magnesium carbonate. So we, we actually don't have graphite. Okay, thank you very much. Thank we you have very another much. question from Luke. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Hi, Kathy. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, obviously, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, very interesting work that uh, has gone in there uh, to build up the, this resource model. I'm just wondering, at Olympic Dam, is there a lot of uh, sort of checking or, or verification uh, that takes place um, uh, to validate the, the model that you have. Um, and I guess, yeah, just to, to confirm whether, you know, what you think you're putting on the belt actually is yep. what you're putting on the belt. Absolutely, uh, absolutely valid question. And, and, and Box from a long time ago, a man named Box, actually all models, you know, oh God, yeah. Mod models, yeah, all models are wrong, some are useful. And, and what we, when you live in a, when you work in an operating environment, your, your predictors are, are being challenged all the time. And if I predict wrong, things will go wrong in that plant or we won't produce the metal that we're supposed to do. So, so we also have programs that we look at at monthly composite samples that are taken through the plant. And, and we can actually look at what we mined what we mined, what we delivered to the plant, what we would have predicted, what we predicted the metallurgical performance was going to be versus what the actual metallurgical performance is going to be. So things like our copper predictors are, are less than 5%. Our predictor of acid consumption is probably right around 5%, sometimes plus or minus a little bit of that. But yes, that's being challenged all the time. And, and it will say it's part of our full reconciliation process, but that's actually how we check and make sure that, that we're actually delivering on what we said on, on our predictions. From the plant, the samples that we collect from the metallurgical plant on a monthly basis, we also take those into the lab and do test work, you know, do leaching and others test on that. 
we can look at say what we would have predicted that performance was versus what it actually was. So we have a couple ways of cross validating that, but it's absolutely critical for a, a, an operating mind. Uh, Alvaro Pinto, do you want to mute your, yourself to ask your question? Hi, Kathy. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you for your presentation. It is really interesting and uh, wordful and uh, also is really nice to hear somebody talking the things as we think they are, but it's very rare to see this kind of approach and to see the, um, this open mind uh, approach to mineralogy. So uh, I have a couple of questions, questions but uh, they are quite simple. Um, I think you touch a very important uh, factor that is the communication. Uh, you, 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 have, uh, you say everything that is important when we are dealing with a very specialized uh, uh, subject and we have to communicate with a very different uh, person. So my, my first question is, what is the strategy to get together, to put together the, the, the mining engineers, geologists and metallurgists talking about mineralogy and having a, perspe a perspective that mineralogy is the, the key factor for the success of the operation. Um, yeah. yeah, very, very, uh, very interesting question. And these are all good questions off of here. As a, as a group, um, the Geomet team is part of our geoscience group, and the geoscience is part of planning and technical for Olympic Dam, and planning and technical includes the uh, mine planners, mine designers, mine planners, and, and process planning. And so, number one, we, we, all, we all kind of work together. The people that, that understand the implications of the mineralogy immediately are, is the process plant because they're, they're the ones that have to deal with that. Our mining engineer friends are, are a little bit more, are a little bit more reluctant or, or take a little bit more convincing. But once they realize that you're not there to actually stop them from doing what they need to do, but you're there to actually help them, it's okay. But our strongest, our strongest allies is the, is the processing plant because they're the ones that actually have to, have to extract all that all the metals out of that ore that you send them. So believe me, they, they are your first ally. In <laughs> fact, when I was doing, doing early metallurgical testing at Olympic Dam, um, the, 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 some of the early chief geologists had said, why do you actually need to worry about worrying about, we mine one stope next door to this stope, why would it be any different than the, than the, the te adjoining stopes? Well, we found out they are. Uh, metallurgists actually were, were my strongest ally. And then from building that base of getting the support from metallurgy, then you go back into geoscience and you build up that base that way. And then, then both sides work together to start building up the support from the mining engineers too. Oh, thank you very much. I think for, for people that is the youngest people in the, in the, in the group, it's very important to know that this process is uh, as difficult as the technical uh, problems you deal. I think this is a, a really yeah. important aspect. Thank you very much. And yeah. the, the other, the other uh, questions I, uh, question I have is about the, 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 the cost of quantitative mineralogy and mineralogy yeah. and uh, all the, the techniques you use. And the uh -huh. Olympic Dam is not a, a regular mine, is not a, a, a typical uh, mine worldwide. Uh, most of the mines have no mineral, mineralogy in, 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 inside the company. They have to, to buy this outside. So um, my question is, being so expensive and is very exp expensive to run this quantitative mineralogy, what do you suggest to the to, for the small companies or for the small uh, mining deposits to do in order to have a sort of information, yeah. not the same information you have in Olympic Dam because this is yeah. huge information, yeah. but at least some information in, mineral in mineralogy that yeah. lives to drive the operation properly. Yeah. Um, for, for 
gang mineralogy, uh, quantitative XRD works pretty well. Shortwave infrared, or sorry, any of the hyperspectral techniques are relatively cheap on your drill core. They really are. You know, you think about how much it costs you to drill, how much it costs to assay, how much it costs to log. Right, getting hyperspectral information, I or or anything, or even using a um, the handheld scanning devices help you get that information. What you should be doing is using trying to relate any of the mineralogical information you do get, whether it be from quantitative XRD off of a learning set or having the benefit of, of hyperspectral information, start doing the work to quant to um, relate that back to your assays because you figure you're going to be, you're going to, you're assaying your drill core. So the most powerful thing is take a, a limited test set of quantitative mineralogy, XR, again, XRD or hyperspectral, and do that work to link it back to your assays in your drill core and start developing your, your predictive mineral modes. That's the best way to go. And it actually doesn't cost that, it really doesn't cost that much to do that. No, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And finally, yeah. I, I would like to, to ask you another, another thing that uh, mineralogy and quantitative mineralogy takes time to, to get the information and to, 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 to get the results. So, yeah. um, what is the time in advance that you study uh, a, a specific area in the in the operation before the production the production reach that area to to yeah. start production? Yeah, that that's a good question, and I didn't explain it on that that simple map. So right now we're extracting ore from probably three quarters of the footprint of that deposit because of trying to maintain a relatively constant grade going into the plant, a constant uh, sulfide mineralogy, and having to consider geotechnical concerns and all that, we mine stopes, and, but we, we, it's almost like a checkerboard pattern across the whole deposit that you work on at any one time. So, so when we first go in and start developing a new area, we do a preliminary amount of geomet work to make sure that there's no really fatal flaws in that area. Um, and then our geomet testing continues on really once we start designing stopes. So we know exactly what's gonna be in production and we just work off of that. But we try not to do any testing on stopes that are, are within two years of the mining of being mined because by within two years for us, you already have all the development around the stopes and everything's ready to go you're just waiting to, to start producing from them. So we, we don't have any areas now that are completely blind to us. We have little pockets that are, but we, we have the benefit, sometimes the benefit, sometimes it not. We, we, do, we have a, almost a, this checkerboard acro, pro, cr, approach across the whole mine that we work on. So, um, but if you're going into a new area, it would, it would take you at least a year, probably two years to build up that metallurgical information that you need in order to do that. Because all those MET testing, it takes time. You know, the measured mineralogy takes time, but the MET testing takes time. And you also need time to actually interpret the data too. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kati. Yeah. It, it was a privilege to have your uh, experience share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from YouTube. Um, okay, thanks for your interesting presentation. Uh, which are your mineralogical studies techniques? Microscopic, MLA, CAM scan. Yep. Our what 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 we do is we do MLA on 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 all of our geometrical testing samples. And, and we do not only MLA on, on the head sample, so just a crushed part of, of that sample. We also do it on all the, the products from that metallurgical testing. So MLA is our preferred one. When we first started doing all of our geomet testing, the big scale of it, we used MLA and QuimScan and we had four or five MLAs going 24 seven for three years. We also had four or five Quim scans going 24 seven for, year, for three years to build up that information that we needed. MLA and Quim scan, gotta remember this is you know, almost 20 years ago now. 
slightly tell you slightly different things. They're, they're pretty good on the gross mineralogy, but what we need to do is build up a big consistent database. So uh, MLA is our choice. It doesn't mean that QuimScan is any worse than, than MLA, but it, it was our choice at the time. We do, we do use XRD on a regular basis too. And, and XRD is good for giving you quick, quick hits of information. It doesn't tell you anything about the mineral associations or the texture of the rock, but it certainly tells you what your bulk mineralogy is and, and is pretty quick and relatively inexpensive. But we, we do use both quantitative XRD and MLA, but MLA is our big workhorse. And even now we still have four or five MLAs, not us, um, our, our private vent, our, our vendor provides that to us going 24 seven. So even today. Okay, thank you very much. Carol, I think we have another question. Yeah, as we have one more. So do you think there is a benefit in using 3D characterization model methods, CT micro tomography for model oh. mineralogy? How do you yeah. minimize the stereological error of MLA? Yep. In flotation, most of the phenomena happen over the surface of entire particles. Yep, yep. Some some things that work to our, our, our big advantage at Olympic Dam. Uh, our sulfides, our sulfide, our sulfides quick float some of the quickest in the world because there's no super gene enrichment on it, and any weathering that occurred in that deposit was long removed by glaciation, you know, 650 million years ago. So we actually have absolute pristine sulfides and flotation is not a problem. But if we were comparing different deposits, stereological corrections become important, but when you're looking within one deposit, and for our deposit, the stereological corrections that are required, actually, that doesn't matter. So we don't actually have to worry about that. If I was doing very detailed flow sheet development, you know, for a processing plant, um, you might have to be concerned with that. Or if we have a, an immediate oxidation problem or a, a rare oxidation problem, you, you have to worry about some surface characteristics, but in general, no, no problem. So the, the 3D stereological corrections don't have to worry about. Now, X-ray tomography is a beautiful thing, but you try to tune that on, on 12,000 samples and populating that across your block model. So if we have very specific questions where uh, we, we have colleagues that work down at the nanoscale on our samples, you know, and all the way up to nanoscale up, up higher, that, that any of these very bespoke methods and, and X-ray tomography is a, is a beautiful thing in there, but I can't do that on 10,000 samples across the deposit. I can't do that on all that. It would inform me about if I was looking at a gold rich area or if I started having problems with the recovery or going into a new deposit and I didn't understand how things were distributed, they're excellent tools, I think, for informing me about what those properties are. But at Olympic Dam, what we rely, what we have to have in order for us to populate this block model that goes over six kilometers long, I have to be able to use methods that allow me to relate what I see like an x-ray tomography back to something that's in the block model, which means assays, which means some geological observation um, or a measured mineralogy. So those, we don't see that as part of routine geomet characterization, but those are absolutely fundamental techniques that are required in order when you're first launching off trying to understand what the distribution of your sulfides or, or your metals are throughout your, throughout your ores and what different properties might be. Olympic Dam, some of the beautiful things about it, even though it might appear to be very complex, it's really a disseminated ore body. So because it's disseminated, because it's not weathered, because all of those other things, the, the mineralogy characterization is very straightforward. And we're lucky on that side where a lot of other deposits are. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is the last question. Thank you again, Casey, for this really nice presentation. Carol, do you have some words? Thank you very much, uh, Katie. I don't have any more questions. It was a really good presentation. 
Okay. And and thanks to the Ore Deposits Hub again. Well, a pleasure to have you here again. Yeah, yeah. And and having the opportunity to present twice is really fantastic off of the geology and the geomet. So highly recommended to everybody. Excellent. And and thank you everybody for listening too. Thank you. <laughs>